I've peeled back the curtain at the risk of not getting reelected. I have explained a lot of the evil that happens in Washington, D.C. I've been that person who stands up, objects. At that point, they hate you for breathing air. Kentucky Congressman Thomas Massey is a thorn in the side of the GOP establishment. This bill's not even written. Are you kidding me? And we're supposed to vote on it tonight? That's why I'm a hell no. He has voted against so many bills, including those championed by his own party, that in 2014, Politico dubbed him Mr. No. I will not sugarcoat this. This is a disappointing day for us. Well, you're making friends you. left and right, Congressman, well, right? Me, I mean, hey, uh, let me, I didn't come to Washington to make friends. I I'm came to Washington you. to save, yeah, well, to save the country. Elected to Congress in 2012 during the height of the Tea Party movement, Massey is also an MIT-trained engineer with 24 patents to his name, who founded a pioneering tech company specializing in 3D scanning and touch computing. He drives an electric car and lives with his family in an off-the-grid farmhouse, which is the subject of a new documentary. Massey is an environmentalist who co-sponsored legislation last year to disband the Environmental Protection Agency. Solar panels may be the energy source of the future, he says, but that doesn't mean we have to mandate or subsidize their use. Reasons Matt Welch recently sat down with Congressman Massey at Freedom Fest in Las Vegas to discuss his battles with the Republican establishment, how Trump's tariffs are breeding cronyism, and the impact he and his fellow libertarians in Congress are having on policy. Congressman Massey, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, a couple weeks ago, I was at the Libertarian Party National Convention mm -hmm. um, and uh, just talking to people. And a lot of people brought up your name. You're one of their favorite people, along with your pal, uh, Justin Amash. And even some people said it'd be great if Thomas Massey maybe ran for the Libertarian Party ticket in 2020. Um, why are you a Republican when so many Libertarians like you? Look, there are a few Libertarians in Congress, and we've all got ours next to our name. Um, there are some Democrats who get close on some issues, like uh, Jared Polis uh, will break away from the party um, on some libertarian issues. And uh, Justin and I are basically always on our own track, which is mostly libertarian. By the way, uh, a mediocre libertarian makes for a great Republican. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, we're trying to shrink the size and scope of government. And that fits inside of the Republican platform with some allowances here and there. Yeah, the allowances seem to be... Uh, uh, get, Military get, spending notwithstanding. Spending spending notwithstanding NSA at the moment. spying notwithstanding. Right, like as uh, soon as Republicans control everything in government, just spending spending seems like it's perfectly fine. Katie bar the door. What is the positive case for someone uh, who considers themselves libertarian, at least half libertarian. I, I don't know exactly how you would describe mm -hmm. yourself along those lines. But what's the positive case for working within the Republican Party as opposed to in the Libertarian Party or just outside flapping their arms around in well, the, nonpartisan politics? The difference is you can get elected as a Republican and then you can actually go to the floor of the House of Representatives and vote. That's not to say there isn't a place for big L libertarians. There's something in Congress that, as we're voting, we call true north. And occasionally we all know that we deviate from true north every now and then. I would like to think that Justin Amash and I and Rand Paul and Mike Lee are pretty close to true north most of the time, maybe 10 degrees off. But the, the Libertarian Party, I think, is, is good to have because they come up with the most morally balanced, principled, uh, rational basis for the decisions that we make in government, and those would be true north. Just to be clear, are you here ruling out a presidential run in 2020 for the Libertarian Party? I am absolutely ruling out a, a run for any office in 2020 as a big L Libertarian. Very good. Now, so you mentioned, and as you do in conversation often, the same names come up a lot. It's you, Justin Amash, Rand Paul, mm -hmm. Mike Lee. Um, first of all, are there other names on the list? There are. <laughs> occasionally, <laughs> occasionally you get surprised. Um, I've backed candidates to come to Congress, and everyone that I've backed is pretty much sold out within a few months of coming to Congress. Go ahead and name names. That's uh, fine. No, no, no. You can go see who I've backed. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a good track, track record. In fact, I tell people they don't want my endorsement um, if they <laughs> want to get elected and not sell out. Let me give you a name of somebody who's come to Congress and really surprised us. Uh, Andy Biggs from Arizona. Uh -huh. If you see two no's on a, on a bill, it's 428 to two. 
uh, the two no's will be most often me and Justin Amash. If you see three, it's now Andy Biggs. And he's doing it on a, a constitutional basis. He recognizes when we, when the Republicans are voting for bigger government and he doesn't fall for it. What do you feel like that you have accomplished uh, since coming to Congress? Not just you, you, um, but your group of, small group of friends there. Um, like what tangibly do you feel like uh, that the world is a better place because you are up there either saying no or trying to say yes on some things? The main thing that I think I've contributed uh, in my time in Congress is an unprecedented level of transparency. I've peeled back the curtain. Uh, at the risk of not getting reelected, I have explained a lot of the evil that happens in Washington, D.C. and how it is broken. Because what I see back in the states and back in our districts are solutions that won't really fix the problem because they, a lot of folks don't understand what the problem is. For instance, some people want a constitutional convention to rewrite or add to the Constitution. The problem is not that we need a new Constitution. The problem is that my colleagues don't follow the Constitution we have. So I'm not in favor of constitutional convention. A lot of people think that term limits will fix things. Term limits might nibble around the edges, but it's fundamentally not going to fix what's broken in Congress. The problems are bigger than that. So one of my contributions, I feel, is to go out there and explain in no uncertain terms how that place is messed up so that the folks back home can dial in their ordinance, their strikes, and, and come up with the right answers and, and maybe unelect a few of the people that they think are doing well that aren't. Talk about transparency and the way things are kind of wrecked and messed up there. Uh, a lot of people don't understand the machinery of the House, the machinery of fundraising and the requirements of this. Tell us a little bit about what is usually required by custom or by pointing at the yeah. chest in terms of your fundraising duties for the party and, and et cetera. Okay, money in politics is a great example of one of those problems that people know about, but they don't understand how the money is corrupting the system. The reality is there are 435 members of Congress, 360 of them are safe. They could almost do anything and get reelected. So the question is, how does money corrupt them? Well, they have to raise money and give it to the party in order to rent or buy their committee assignments. Like literally the party comes to you, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, and says, if you want an important committee, you're going to have to pay us this much money not one time, but every election cycle. The, you can't go back to your district and ask your constituents at a fundraiser to help you buy a seat on a committee. You get that money from the lobbyists who are in Washington, DC. Now, let me be clear. I'm not against lobbying as a profession. I'm not against my colleagues who pay their dues. That's a euphemism for extortion who pay the extortion to the NRCC in order to gain a better committee assignment and to keep a better committee assignment. I'm calling out the leaders in our party and in the other party who've set up the structure that causes people to become captive to the lobbyists and to that money. Who knocks on your door? How does that process work? Oh, they don't even knock on your door. They come on the floor of the House of Representatives and they've got a little assessment card and they'll slip it in your pocket while you're voting and say, by the way, Thomas, you're $300,000 overdue. We expect you to pay something this quarter. I mean, call me crazy. That just sounds like a shakedown operation. It sounds like the mafia. It's a total shakedown. Now, again, what they do with the money is not a bad thing. People aren't buying Ferraris and, and yachts with that money in the Republican Party, they're trying to get members elected in that party so they can either keep the majority in the case of the Republicans or take back the majority in the case of the Democrats. It, again, it's the incentive structure and the way it influences behavior that is wrong, not what they do with the money, not the people who are there who have to pay the extortion, and, and not the lobbyists who are able to provide the money. So is that why the, all the people that you've endorsed have turned out bad? Is that they got caught up in that incentive structure? Or that yeah. Bad's too strong of a word, but like disappointing from what you initially expected. Is it because they responded to the, the institutional incentives there in the way that people do? It's kind of like the Hunger Games, the movie. You're like It seems like an honor to represent your district. But then when you get placed on the island, you, you realize you've got to grab weapons. You have to weaponize and you are still running. You have to compete when you're there. 
And so these, these folks get elected from their district, they come and they realize I'm gonna to have to weaponize. I'm gonna to have to get a better committee assignment than the person next to me. And they do this, maybe not in the beginning because they're morally compromised, but because they wanna represent their constituents in the best way they know how, and they believe that getting a more powerful committee will let them represent their constituents better. So I don't blame them for selling out. I don't blame the players, but we've got to change the game. And the more the people know about this, whether they're libertarian or Democrat or Republican, the more they can work from the outside to change it. They could ask their congressman, how much do you pay your party every, every quarter to keep that committee assignment? Uh, so is this like Serpico or whatever? Like, do they all hate you? Do all the crooked cops hate the clean cop in this case? Well, you, you know, I've exposed this on the internet uh, multiple times and in interviews, and nobody has once challenged at least not on record with a name. Maybe some anonymous Republican aide might have challenged what I've said, but nobody with the name has ever challenged what I've said. And so they do. You become hated for breathing air next to them uh, because you've exposed how this incentive structure works, partly because they've paid so much into this structure, right? They got there and they've decided to invest. They've, they've got, got some skin equity. In the game, yeah. yeah, they've got skin in the game. And so they, they dislike you for that. And it's that and other things cause them to dislike you. For instance, uh, every vote in the house is a voice vote until one person objects, at which point it becomes a recorded vote of 435 members. Now, more than half a dozen times, I've been that person who stands up, objects, demands a recorded vote on some issues that people would rather not be recorded on. At that point, they hate you for breathing air. And, and the, the pressure, it's like being deep underwater. You, physically, to have so many people around you who hate you for being there, it, it constricts your chest and you take shorter breaths and it's hard to breathe. Wow. Uh, do you, I mean, is it just the feel a sense of seething or do they get up right in your face and, and give you the business in the cloakroom? It depends on the member. I have been <laughs> yelled at. I've been screamed at. Usually it's because they lost their cool and they're coming back. They will come back the next day and apologize. But um, it's mostly the people who don't say anything that um, are most upset with you. But they're playing the game and they know part of the game is never to show that you're upset. But you can feel it. It's tangible. The leadership will call your donors and tell them to quit giving you money. And they'll give a compelling argument why they should quit giving you money. Uh, they will deny your bills a hearing in committee or a vote on the floor. They will take your bills and give them to somebody else and put their name on it and pass it. What? Has that <laughs> yes. happened to you? Yeah. This happened a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Walter Jones and I, three years ago, and in two Congresses, have introduced a bill to get rid of this perk that a Speaker of the House enjoys after he's no longer Speaker of the House. The taxpayer has for years since the 70s been paying to keep an office for ex-speakers of the House. They get, uh, they get a full staff, they get a postage budget, and they get an office inside of the Capitol and they can, still, they can be an outside lobbyist and still keep this office. That's crazy. Denny Hastert milked up more than a million dollars from the taxpayer through, through this office by using this office. And so we introduced a bill to get rid of that. We were told it was spiteful toward the ex-speaker uh, Which we, it was. We, <laughs> not somebody, there's anything wrong with that. Somebody wrote an article that said these two Republicans are still trying to get rid of John Boehner <laughs> after he was no longer the speaker. We were obviously trying to get rid of the office. Anyways, we were shut down, stopped. We tried it in an amendment form. We tried it as a standalone bill. At each step of the game, we were stopped and told, no, we're not going to let you get a vote. And then uh, a few weeks ago, Paul Ryan announced he had slipped it into an appropriations bill, and this was part of his legacy, was to get rid of this office. He was doing the noble and right thing. And um, they just, I mean, Walter Jones was the primary sponsor. I was the secondary, but they just took our bill after telling us it was a bad idea and then claimed it as their own. And to add insult to injury, they will raise money for super PACs who will come to our districts and say we were ineffective. Uh, well, I mean, the po point is you keep your eye on the prize and you got a good thing passed, right? You're... Oh, yeah. I don't mind that we don't get credit. It's, it's when they go and say you didn't get anything done. Right. Knowing that they took your bill.
And there are other bills. I don't want to get into it for because I'll I'm, I will engender more hate for <laughs> blowing the whistle on these folks. Yeah. So you and, and Justin Amash are oftentimes the guys to make sure that nothing gets vo- voice voted. Uh, and I think Rand Paul does something similar. He's oftentimes the only. He's a one uh, yeah. on several occasions there. And I know you're all friends and you're a state mate with uh, with uh, with Rand. Um, do you guys kind of have a, 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 a target on the back club, like a little pity party club? Do you just are you just hitting shots? And I don't know about Amash, but you and Rand uh, hitting shots in the, in the back. How do you deal with being pariahs in your own workplace? You know, there's an un- another interesting phenomenon that goes on. About once a week or once every two weeks, I will have a member of Congress come to me and say, I just had a town hall and my constituents asked me to be more like you or to vote more like you. Sometimes they come to me and say, "Uh, I've got a couple kids and you're their favorite congressman. This is another congressman speaking to us on the floor. So not everybody hates us. We're not a pariah to everybody. Uh, In fact, I, I believe that some of them secretly wish that they could carve out more space to vote their conscience instead of voting the party or voting the way that their funders want them to vote. And so secretly they wish they could be more independent than they really are. Uh, As far as having a club, the great thing about having an, an ideology and a set of principles that's consistent is you don't have to check in with each other to know how the other one's going to vote on an issue. I can I could go on a TV show at the same time that Rand is on a TV show and Justin Amash is on a TV show. And without talking to each other, I'm pretty sure we're going to be saying the same thing about a bill. And so it's convenient when you don't have to get together and and collude and say, what's our story going to be on this? So is there any hope of getting more of you? Felt like the the wind was at the, the, the back of people like you back in 2010, 2012, all the way up to maybe 2014. Uh, it seemed like the, the 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 pool was growing. It doesn't seem like that anymore. Uh, is there any reinforcements on the horizon? You get a bluebird every election cycle. For instance, uh, I mentioned Andy Biggs has been really good. Matt Gates has been really good. Um, we didn't. I didn't expect that. I didn't know they were going to be good. It's almost like the sort of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, or the act of voting actually determines how you're going to vote. It's impossible to know before somebody gets there how they're going to respond to all of the stimulus that they receive and how they're eventually going to vote. And so um, we get a few and it almost seems random to me. Uh, We get a lot of Justin Amash's and, and Rand Paul's and Thomas Massey's who I think sell out in the first six months. They think they're going to do one thing. They believe it in their heart. Their family knows it. Their constituents know it. And they end up doing something else. Let's talk about uh, something that's important to all Americans, which is bourbon. Uh, <laughs> so we're starting trade wars uh, now. Uh, presumably, you're not a fan of trade wars, although I don't presume to speak entirely for you. You're certainly a fan of bourbon uh, yeah. and, and of jobs. You are popular in your uh, district. The president is popular in your district. Bourbon is popular in your district. And jobs are popular yeah. in your district. How is this stuff playing out right now? Well, trade wars, like... Uh, violent wars start in much the same way right now. It should be Congress who decides when we're going to initiate some kind of tariff. The founding fathers never intended for one person in the executive branch to pass a tax on every American, yet that's what's happening. And much like the executive branch has usurped the power to make war, which was reserved to Congress, the executive branch has now usurped the power to make trade war. And that's where we are. It's interesting, the president used national security as the justification for the first shot in the trade war. The uh, foreign countries reciprocated, retaliated, and now we're retaliating, but the justification is you're allowed to retaliate when when, uh, somebody imposes an unfair tariff on you. And so this thing has escalated. I say it's like a bad divorce. Uh, In a bad divorce, both spouses lose and the lawyer ends up with more money in his pockets, right? In a trade war, both sets of citizens lose and the governments end up with more money in their pockets. So yes, uh, I'm against trade wars, particularly when they affect 
or bourbon in Kentucky. You know, 95% of bourbon is from Kentucky distilled there. The other 5% is counterfeit, regardless of <laughs> what people tell you. This is a fact. Um, and so, but here's the interesting thing that I've observed. A lot of our bourbon brands were bought by foreign companies due to our bad tax laws. It made sense for a foreign company to hold the brand. Particularly before tax. Yeah, before tax uh, reform. Now that's one of the things that we fixed. But you, I've got a brand in my district, I won't call out any names, that's owned by a British company. And so when the EU decided to uh, impose tariffs on Kentucky bourbon, they actually, they did two things. They raised the price of bourbon for their own people in the European Union, and they also tariffed one of their own companies. And what this shows you is how complicated tariffs are in a global economy. It's, it's almost impossible to see all, all of the permutations and, and results of tariffs but when you balance the equations and reduce the fractions and figure out who wins and loses, it's always the customer that sees a higher price. Do you have a sense of what the damage could be just to the bourbon industry because it's, it's a closer to you? Well, you know, I think the elasticity of demand for bourbon is different than the elasticity of demand for steel and, and whatnot and where it comes from. People are still going to want to drink Kentucky bourbon. It's a bargain at twice the price, right? <laughs> so I think the people will still pay for, for bourbon and I, uh, hopefully it won't affect us that much. We're told this is a bloodletting, that eventually this will stop and it will result in zero tariffs on both sides. Uh, here's the problem with that. I mean, I hope that's the case. I hope we get fewer tariffs for our products going into other countries and then eventually our tariffs, i.e. taxes, go away. But we're also being told this will protect American businesses and that manufacturing, for instance, steel will come back to the United States. Well, what CEO is going to start a, a new factory based on the story that uh, it's only going to be profitable in, when there is a tariff and that this tariff is going to go away as soon as possible? Yeah. Nobody's going to open a new business based on that. They might keep a business that's marginal or about to fail in business for a few more months, but nobody's going to start a new endeavor and invest capital based on a decision that's made by one executive. And that executive says, we're going to, I may change my decision tomorrow. Do you, I mean, not to be rude about the sitting president of the United States, mm -hmm. um, but do you get the sense that he understands international trade? I'm going to say that uh, his intuition on some of these things is right. In what sense? I, I will tell you that I, I do not like the fact that Congress is now subservient to the World Trade Organization. Um, everything that you purchase has a country of origin labeling label on it. Like this suit tells you that it wasn't made in America. Um, your, your phone will say where it's made, uh, your fruits and vegetables, your fish. But Congress, we were told a few years ago that the World Trade Organization had ruled and we were going to have to remove country of origin labeling from beef and pork because it created a hardship for uh, cattle and pigs that were coming from Canada and from Mexico. And I, I don't like that fact. This is, these are not judges at the World Trade Organization that are appointed by Congress, by elected officials. And so when the president speaks about uh, going more to bilateral agreements than a multilateral agreement, which requires some kind of world government, not to sound conspiratorial, no, but, but that's what it is. It's a world court. Uh, heavily tilted in favor of the United States, who wins almost all the disputes. Well, we I mean, we lost the one with Canada and Mexico. Right. Uh, we'll be losing some in, in the near future, yeah, I, right. I have no doubt. So, so, I don't know. Let's see. This, You know what? We've got a great test case. I could be wrong. Things could turn out wonderfully. Um, the tariffs could go away. Uh, you know, uh, let me let me say something else too. If and and this upsets some uh, libertarians, so that's kind of why says, I want to say smiling, it. yes, <laughs> leaning in. <laughs> but is it is it worse to tax production than it is to tax consumption? I don't think you can make the the case that it's more moral to tax your labor than it is to tax your consumption of foreign goods. So in the beginning of our country, 90% of the revenues for our country came from tariffs. Now, if you, so if you wanted to replace 
the income tax, if you wanted to repeal the 16th Amendment and replace it with a flat tariff, I could entertain that. The problem with these selective tariffs is now you've, you've walked into the area of central planning. Yeah. And now you're pretending that the Department of Commerce, just like some department in the Soviet Union, uh, would know better whether we need more steel or less steel in this country, whether we need more steel plants or less steel plants. It sounds like FDR. It sounds like the Soviet Union. It sounds like China, although they're in some ways more capitalist than we are on these issues. And so I don't like selective tariffs from a central planning standpoint. There's another problem that I'm witnessing firsthand in Congress with tariffs. That is, you can apply for an exemption to a tariff. Of course. If, if you're company endures some hardship that's going to put it out of business, well, you can send Wilbur Ross a letter and fill out the form and go to the website. And there are, I think, at least 10,000 exemption applications right now. It's certainly in the thousands. So we recently had a meeting with about 30 congressmen and Secretary Ross, and 28 of the 30 congressmen were there to ask Secretary Ross for a special exemption for a company in their district who had applied for the exemption. Now you are in the area of cronyism. Absolutely. I don't like to call it crony capitalism because it's not capitalism. It's, it's uh, markets being driven by favors. The, the more access you have, the fewer taxes, i.e. tariffs, you would have to pay. And that's the, the sort of race to the bottom that you get into. When you I start mean, it reminds this. me of, uh, of uh, you know, heavily zoned or heavily regulated local zoning ordinances and the types of places which I live, unlike your off the grid farm. Yeah. I end up living in Los Angeles, Washington or New York. So they're super heavily regulated. And what do you do if you are a person or a company? You spend all your life going to City Hall, getting exemptions, getting variances of the zoning regulations. And that's the friction that makes a lot of uh, kind of money flow in politics. Um, and it just seems like a lot of wasted effort. And the, and it also uh, you've just made me worry about the present moment even more. Um, it sounds like a built in incentive structure for Congress critters, including people who've spent their lives talking about the virtues of free trade. Well, now there's the virtues of doing a favor for your constituents and looking like the, you know, the, the white knight on the horse. Right. Um, which it, is it, a bad. It's a little worse than that because, okay. yeah, these congressmen were uh, advocating on behalf of their constituents. So they might get some credit for that exemption that the executive branch and the executive branch alone grants. But at the end of the day, you are enriching the executive branch, frankly, at the expense of the congressional legislative branch because it's the executive branch that can issue those variances. So now they, they become more powerful because they can issue variances to these tariffs. It's a, it's a really bad situation. Like I said, if you wanted a flat 10% tariff on every product coming into this country and you got rid of the income tax, that might not be such a bad thing. But by allowing variances, by picking which segments of the economy are going to be taxed and which ones aren't, you in, are enriching and empowering the executive branch, which is a very dangerous thing. So let's find some place for optimism because I'm, I'm feeling like I need it after the end of this conversation. Um, are you getting, are you, is there something good on the horizon that's, that's happening, some kind of reform? criminal justice? Are you legalizing hemp? What are you doing? What, what are the, propos the, the prospects for a good thing happening kind of under the radar right now? I think the federal prohibition on the marijuana plant will be gone within a decade. Oh. And it's, it's not going to be because of any bravery on the part of legislators that I serve with. The states are taking the lead. And if you remember, that's how we got rid of the 55 mile an hour federal speed limit as some states said no this is ridiculous and some people started driving faster and we found out it actually was just fine and um, I think the same thing is going to happen with the federal prohibition on the marijuana plant within a decade uh, if the vote were today the federal prohibition would go away it's just a, a, a slim uh, number of people in leadership in Congress that are keeping that vote from happening and so a change in leadership could mean that issue gets resolved tomorrow. So there's who, who is a prospective leader who would put that to a vote? Oh, would Jim Jordan put that to a vote? Um, I don't know if he would put his I don't know what his personal feelings are on that issue. And if he would uh, put a finger on the scale of that, he would be far 
more likely to let the body do its will than Paul Ryan is right now. Paul Ryan's been worse than John Boehner in terms of al allowing individual members of Congress to have a part in the process, far worse. Bob Corker uh, in the Senate uh, gave a speech about a month ago talking about how we just don't vote on anything anymore. Like it's, the, the voting has stopped. Um, nothing gets to the floor, the same kind of bottlenecking that's happening. And I wonder, since we're talking about incentives and complaining in general about Congress abdicating all its basic responsibility, what is, is, what's the structural incentive for Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer and, and, and Paul Ryan and John Boehner and everybody to act in this way? And Nancy Pelosi. And Nancy Pelosi, thank you. To act in this way. It seems, uh, you know, you can, Ryan was supposed to be marginally better than Boehner and mm -hmm. you and other people say that he's worse on, on this specific issue. But there must be some kind of reward system that's making that happen. What is it? Okay, I told you there's a dues system for members of Congress who want a better committee assignment. There's an assessment, and it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to get or keep a better committee seat. The assessment on a speaker is in the tens of millions. Like the speaker is expected to raise 50 to $100 million every election cycle for the party. God. That comes with some encumbrances to the donors, <laughs> if you can imagine, 50 to $100 million of encumbrances. And, uh, their other incentive for short-circuiting the, the power of the House is when, when they, uh, they short-circuit the legislative process and there are only four people in the room writing the bill, those four people become more powerful. Mm -hmm. Now, oftentimes at the expense of the power of the legislative branch, but they are trading our power as legislators to the executive branch so that each of them can have more power so that they can go to the White House, they sit down, okay, what do you want in this appropriations bill? Okay, that's what we'll put in it. And then after four people write a, a 2,300 page bill, it's brought back to us and we have eight hours to read it and vote on it. And so they have way more power, the leadership in Congress does, than um, if there were an open process. How do you avoid just saying, America, you're drunk, go home? Uh, you know, wh how, what, what makes you want to continue in this line of work besides the cushy job and benefits? The cushy job and benefits, yes. As you know, I had a very good livelihood in the private sector. Uh, and uh, this is not a cushy job. And it's, I've turned down most of the benefits, uh, like the health care and whatnot. Um, so what makes me want to do it? I do see results. Look, we did force John Boehner out. Now, we got somebody who was worse, but at the end of the day, the swamp did not want him to leave. They were in full out panic for a few weeks until they figured out how they're going to patch everything up. The fact that you can occasionally cause the, the swamp to go into a full panic shows me that there is hope. Bringing transparency to the process, I, I want the American people to be equipped with the knowledge they need to advocate for things that will fix Congress. Constitutional Convention, I'm sorry, is not going to fix Congress. If my colleagues don't follow the Constitution we've got, they're not going to follow a new one. Uh, term limits, um, I co-sponsored two term limit bills. I will vote for them. They will not fix the problems we have. And so uh, I have hope, I have optimism in that when the American people get the information that I've been able to obtain by being behind the curtain, that they will start advocating for things that will fix the process. Very good. Well, thank you very much for talking with us today, Congressman Thomas Massey. For Reason, I am Matt Welch.